Hey everyone, welcome to this installment in the Splunk playlist here at my YouTube site. And in this video, we're going to take a closer look at the search and reporting app. You might remember in the previous video, we made this search and reporting app the default app of the Splunk web interface. Well, now let's get in and make sure we understand just how this search and reporting app functions and let's take a look at some of the features of it. So here you can see I am going to sign in to my Splunk web interface. Remember, if you need guidance on getting your Splunk installed or anything like that, check the appropriate videos in the playlist, of course. So here I am logging into Splunk and seeing that my default application is not the home app, which is what Splunk sets up by default, but I've gone and switched it to that search and reporting app. As I mentioned in the previous video, kind of neat, this is actually a button over here, so that will refresh your screen. That'll refresh the search and reporting app. This is a button up here. It'll refresh your default application, which in our case is the search and reporting app. And then we have the search and reporting app menu system that you can see here. So search, analytics, data sets, reports, alerts, dashboards, we'll end up visiting all of these as we go through these videos, but we are going to be focusing on this search tab. Notice one of the first things that we see with the search and reporting app is the search field. That's right. And one of the things that is built into this field is the search command. Yeah, there is a search command in Splunk and that's what we use to do our searches. So as an example, we loaded a whole bunch of test data in a test index in one of our previous videos. So I'm going to search the index called test for all time and I am going to run this search and notice what the search field does. It removes the search command because yes, Splunk built that command into the functionality of this field. We can do searches within searches. So we will be seeing instances of the search command in our search later on in these videos. But notice we have done a search of the test index over all time and notice what happens. We see a sampling of the events inside of our Splunk web interface and the search and reporting app. Notice that there was 109,864 events that matched this search of index equals test. So notice one of the key elements that made this search function was the time range picker. Yes, it's very easy to forget your time range picker and do your search over the test index for the last 24 hours and you don't get any results. Oh, what a bummer. Yeah, we need to, for our test data, remember to change the time range picker to all time because many of our events inside of the index have a timestamp on them that is from long, long ago. This is one of the challenges when we input, you know, test data that is, you know, from many years ago, the timestamps in that data. So just something to be aware of. Okay, now continuing our tour of the search and reporting interface, notice up at the top here when we do a search, we have some options. I could save this search as a report or an alert. I could add it to a new or existing dashboard. We can make an event type out of it so that we can more easily call it up at a later time point. If we want to start looking at our data in a table view, the data that we just pulled, we can go ahead and do that. So that's another option that we have inside of the interface here. And notice that uh, something else that we can do is we can go ahead and close that search up. 
Uh, remember, many ways to do that. We could just click on the search and reporting button there to refresh the search. Notice we also have a search history. So Splunk is capturing everything that we do and I can easily get back to that search I just did using my search history and adding that previous search to a new search, selecting my time range and seeing all of my events. By the way, it looks like the events got timestamped for the day I uploaded them. So we should be able to see like last seven days and no, nope, uh, yeah, that would give us results as well. Uh, notice not all of the results though. So some of the events that we brought in got timestamped rather le recently, but other of the events are timestamped uh, much, much longer ago. So again, to be safe when we're working with test data, we do an all time search against our data. Notice something else that's available to us is the mode of search in search and reporting. We'll get into this in great detail later on, but just so you know, the default as we've seen is smart mode, and that is balancing your search performance against the inclusion of fields and data in your events. So this is trying to balance performance with completeness, and that is why it is the default mode. Notice that we are not event sampling in any way. So if you go and look at this search job with this job menu here, and we inspect the job, the job inspector says, okay, we gave you 2,902 sample results because there's 109,000 events that actually match your search. And notice the search took 4.357 seconds. If we want more details about the search and exactly what took so long, we can go down and look at that. And we also have search job properties in here as well. So notice the event sampling will give guidance to how the sample events are gonna be pulled for us, but Splunk is great at showing us sample events for our searches on its own. Notice that job menu uh, that we just used. And one of the things you should be aware of with the job menu is that you can edit the job settings. Maybe I need to make sure everyone has access to this job I just ran. And so I want it to live in Splunk for seven days. I can even copy the job link from here and then save these settings. So someone could come in and look at this query and maybe give me guidance on how I could optimize it. Of course, there's nothing that we could do really to optimize this where we wanna see absolutely every single event that is inside of our test index, but you get the idea. We might manipulate the job settings because we need someone that knows even more about Splunk processing language to help us out. If you ever had a query that was running for an awfully long time, notice you could pause the query. You could also stop the query. We can share the query results very easily. And this is the copy job link that we saw earlier inside the job menu. You can print, you can export, and notice the export format when we are dealing with these events that we pulled up in search. We can export as a CSV, we can export as XML, we can export as JSON, we can even just dump the raw events into a text file. <laughs> kind of funny, that's much like they existed before we brought them into Splunk. So plenty of great options for export. Notice now when we do the search, we get this nice timeline view. Yeah, this is pretty neat. So we can roll our mouse over and we can get information on how many events fall on which days. And notice there's little column charts here or a column bar that enables you to see uh, days where there was a lot of event activity. 
Sure enough, if you click on one of these bars in the timeline, you will filter your results just for that particular segment. So now we're seeing everything from April 10th. If you click and drag, you'll have the same effect. So now I'm seeing one day and five hours worth of stuff inside the test index. Notice you can zoom out and even zoom to a selection. And this is pretty interesting because when we do this, we actually run a new query. Yeah, notice there's a date time range that has automatically been inserted and now we've done a new query. If I want to click zoom out, uh, sure enough, it's going to do just that. It'll start zooming out. And of course, if we ever want to get back to our preset, we just go up here to say, look, I want to see absolutely everything over all time. But it is pretty nifty, right? How this timeline format gives us this nice view of the events and we can click and drag inside there and see different filtered views of our events. Notice, here's our events down below, and we're showing uh, them in a certain format. We can control that. We're seeing 20 per page. We can control that. We're seeing them in this list view. And here are the different pages of events that are available. Now, what Splunk does is it's really taking our machine data, and it's trying to really help us out by identifying fields. So here is what we call the fields sidebar, and this is an incredibly important part of Splunk. In fact, I'm going to record a video for you just on this fields sidebar, because there is a lot to learn about the field sidebar, and we're going to be working with that field sidebar quite quite intensely. Now, notice in addition to getting our events, right, there is a patterns tab. So you can go in and have Splunk try and identify patterns in your data. So notice this is the first time I'm going there. And so Splunk now is hard at work trying to scan the data and find patterns in it. Notice it's taking quite a bit of time there, and that's because, of course, I gave it so much initial data, the 109,000 events there. So we could always reduce this scale and have it work quicker with a smaller amount of our data. Now, the statistics and the visualization tabs, notice, aren't really functional right now. And this is a big question that students will often have of how come I'm not seeing any statistics and how come I'm not seeing a pretty picture about my data? And this is because this initial simple search we have done of just show me everything in the test index this didn't produce any statistical information. It's just a list of all of the 109,000 events. So there's nothing by way of a statistical table or a visualization. To get that, we would have to do some kind of a, what we call, transforming command. And let me show you what that would look like. Notice there is a field inside of our data no surprise, there's a field inside of our data called client IP. All right, there is a client IP field in our data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here and I'm going to use a transforming command. I'm going to say to Splunk, index equals test, and please pipe these results. So I do a pipe on the keyboard, and I say pipe these results to a command called top, and I want to see the top client IP addresses. So notice I say, go get everything from the test index and pipe that to the top command. And I want to see what are the top 10 client IP addresses in our index called test. 
So I run this query and sure enough, now we have a statistics tab completed. That's right, we have done what's called a transforming command to the data and we can see the top 10 client IP addresses in our overall test index and we can see the count of how many events these IP addresses appeared in. Notice it also gives us the percent. If we want a pretty picture with this data, we can go over to the visualization tab and this is where we have our pretty pictures. For instance, I might want to go in and say, you know what, limit this to the top five IP addresses. So I'm going to run that query and then I'm going to say, you know what, I think this would look best in a pie chart. So there we have it. There's a nice pie chart of the top five IP addresses that are in our test index. And by the way, I shouldn't say IP addresses, specifically client IP addresses. Yes, these are IP addresses that are listed in a client IP field in the data. All right, so that's an explanation as to why when we do something like pull up all of the events from our test index, by default, with a search like that, we're not going to see anything on our statistics or visualization tabs by default. We're just going to get our events. Well, everyone, this was a tour of this search and reporting app. Don't worry if it seems a little intimidating. You're going to be feeling very comfortable with the search and reporting app after going through videos and following along. Yeah, we become one with the glorious search and reporting app of Splunk, one of their key applications that you would use to analyze data that you're bringing into the Splunk environment. Thanks so much for joining me in this video. Be sure to subscribe to my channel because I'll be creating more of these and you're going to want to be alerted when they arrive here at YouTube. Thanks again for watching.